here's what the uh, fiddle looks like clamped up with the horrible fright clamps in there. With the help of those, I had enough to at least go around the bouts. Now, I still got the waste to do on both sides, um, down in the bottom there. I do have the waste to do, but, you know, I can do those tomorrow. While I was at horrible fright, horrible fright. I bought a motion light that is solar powered. Had a coupon for it, of course. And thought I might just mention to you, with all my genetic defects, one of them is that I'm completely night blind. I mean like night blind, like I can't see this if it was right in front of my eyes outside. Unless the moon's really bright or something. I mean, I seriously can't tell nothing. So, I have, and I think I might have said this before, but I, in more than one instance, I've actually walked all the way across my parking lot looking for my car <laughs> in the dark and end up out there in the pasture. <laughs> and then I have to find the building because I can't even see the building. It's pretty bad, trust me. So, it's more than time now to get some light out there. So that's what I'm going to install. Look at this thing, by the way. It's uh, I'll turn it on auto. Look at there. Look how bright that thing is. It's making the screen go dark instantly. There you go. You can tell how bright it is on my face. Horrible fright. Anyway, more fun to install. Here we go. My friends, it's the next day and we are slowly sneaking up on finishing this violin. You know, we've got the main parts here now and pretty much just got to go put it back together now. It's fairly straightforward. Before I do that though, you know, I've always said that, you know, people use more cleats than are necessary. And I seriously doubt this crack will come apart because I glued it with the uh, tight bond original and I doubt it'll come apart. But because of the history of this violin, of having come apart so many times, I think I'm going to go ahead and cleat it just to be on the safe side. Mostly, again, just because of the history. I don't think it'll come apart, but you know, this way I, I can be sure it won't come apart, or at least feel more certain. These are about a millimeter and a half thick, or 1.5 millimeter. I say 1.5 millimeter for my fractionally challenged friends out there in millimeter land. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I know you know fractions too. Just kidding. Just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> Can't you take a joke? <laughs> anyway. So this ought to fix that problem. I might actually put one or two more on here because the crack goes pretty far. I'm gonna have to clamp these. I may clamp them with magnets. I think that'll be sufficient. I think I'll put one more on there. The way I make these is just eyeball them to the same size basically. Chop them off. The uh, grain is running perpendicular to the top. And just in case you have any doubts, if you look at that, I think you can see that the grain is running perpendicular to the top there. Okay, I'll go ahead and get some magnets and stick on there on both sides, and that should clamp it enough together, I believe. Well, there you can see how I clamped it up. I used a combination of magnets and clamps. And the reason I switched between there is because you get the, that many magnets that close together and they jump across, it's really a pain in the neck. So, you know, if you have them separated like that, then you're fine. So that's why I did what I did. Those little magnets are pretty stout, and what I did was I squeezed each one of them together like that with my fingers, and then let the magnet hold it there. So that should be fine. I'll give that about an hour, and then we'll uh, shave those down with the finger plane so that they're nice and tiny and thin. Then we're just about ready to glue the top on to the sides, and I think that's what we'll do next. After that, then we'll fit the neck for the angle. So just a few more steps, and we've actually got a uh, 
fully together violin. Well, friends, you can see here that I've shaved those down and they're nice and thin now and, and beveled off. The one thing that still kind of bothers me though is right here where about where the sound post is going to go right in here. This wood is kind of chowdered up. It's as if they put way too much pressure on their sound post or maybe when the sound post was in here this thing got hit from the top or something. That's probably what cracked it right here at the sound post. I don't know if you can see it or not, but there's dents. Like right here is a big deep dent and right here is a deep dent. These are splintery areas. I'm not exactly sure how I want to tackle that. You know, there's no good answer really. I mean, if I put a patch there, well then it's kind of in the way of the sound post unless I put a large patch where you can move the sound post around and I don't really want to do that. So I think, you know, if we were talking about a, a really expensive type violin, I'd probably do something different. But I think on this violin, you know, f for the kind of violin it is and for the value, etc., I think the smartest idea is just to fill it with some sort of filler. They're not huge holes, but they are there and they will interfere with moving the sound post around. So I think that's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to fill them uh, with a filler and I'll show you what that looks like here in a minute. So even though I know that the traditionalists, the purists are turning over right now, you know, having a fit about this fill, I still think that that's the smart way to, to handle a, an instrument like this without spending hours plugging this in here and making it perfect. Because, you know, if you don't make it perfectly smooth, your sound post is going to grab and catch on everything. And now it's perfectly smooth and that only took a couple of minutes to do. We will go ahead and put this on now uh, onto the body. My one problem with this, I mean, everything is fine other than the way this thing is shaped. And I don't know if it's due to the fact that maybe it was played a long time without the base bar being attached because the whole side over here is flattened off compared to this side. But I still think it's probably going to be fine, you know, Again, I would rather have grandpa's top on it than, you know, a replacement top. So I'm just going to go ahead and go with it and just assume it's going to work. If it doesn't work for some reason, well, we've got another top and we could change it if we have to. But we're going to go with it for now. And we just don't know until we get it all together how it's going to actually turn out going to get the glue on here. I've already leveled all this flat with a large flat sanding uh, block. I think in a recent video it probably just either the clip was missing or it got edited out but I always level the glue like this and spread it after putting it on before applying a top. So there were some comments about that on a previous guitar video, I think, but I always do this. You really can't do it any other way. You have to do this. Now, it's not to say I don't sometimes set them on there to see how they're making contact, because I do that occasionally, but then I come back and spread it. I also spread it like this so that there's not so much squeeze out in one spot or whatever and make a big mess inside which can happen if you don't spread it out. Yeah, I can't imagine putting this together without that little lining that I put on there. That lining sure does give you a little bit of glue surface. There was no surface at all before other than the blocks and that's probably why it all came apart. That should be good. Well, now we just have to get her matched up there. Kind of having to split the difference there on a few things and we'll just have to make it work. That looks pretty good. I'll get the clamps and get started clamping it up. Well there's a look at her all clamped up. We'll let that set for sure till late in the day so it'll be four or five hours before I mess with taking the clamps off. 
Well, it's been about two and a half hours since I glued the top on, so I took the clamps off. And I've off camera, I've been working on the neck joint here and the angle, and I've got the neck angle and joint fitting up pretty good. I think it's pretty good. It's a little loose in a place or two, and if I can figure out how to tighten that up, I'm going to. Looks like there's just the slightest bit of width is my problem, like it's just a hair wider than this is. So what I'll probably do is just cut a paper thin shim and put it down in here before I push this down in there to keep it solid. And I'll test that off camera and everything, but assuming I can get a little thin shim in there, I think I'm ready to glue this in. I have sanded this little strip of mahogany down to 15 thousandths of an inch with my homemade thickness sander. I dare you to try that with a commercial thickness sander. I don't think you'll get that done. And I mean, this is really thin. In fact, it's so thin, there's no way to really cut this. You just cut it with a pair of scissors. <laughs> it's that thin. I'm just using that as a spacer on the side there just to tighten up the, the side of the joint and I'm just testing it and I think that's going to work. And I think that's exactly what I need right there. That way now the joint is good and tight. The old German word there, good and tight. So what I'll do is trace that because I believe I have it down in there perfectly tight and I'll trace around it with my little fine pencil take that apart I think you can probably see the little pencil line there that's how much of a shim we have and as I said before we just cut it with the scissors I think is the best way to do it it's incredibly thin there, you could not cut this on a saw it would just tear and break so I think that'll work and now we'll get glue in here I've already cleaned this out with a chisel and got rid of everything I want out of there and I've got it meeting up pretty well so now we'll just fill it up with glue really good and the best way for me to do that is to use a brush and just paint it around got more glue on there than I need for sure I'll put the shim in there where it belongs paint it in place got more glue than I need so I'll take that glue extra glue spread it on here and that should do the trick Hopefully that shim will stay where it's at. Whoops. The trick here is to look your alignment this way. Your twist on it, of course. Can't do much about the twist since it already fits that gap that it was made there. And then the main thing you can control is the height back here. And you want the height to be correct. It's very important for your bridge height and I always set them at 7 eighths of an inch and that is exactly where that's at right now, 7 eighths of an inch. So if it was any better than that, it would be perfect and then it wouldn't look like I did it. So I'm going to stop right there. While the neck joint is gluing up there and, you know, curing, I think I'm going to work on this back here. I found the original little tail block and uh, you know, I could use that. It doesn't actually look horrible or anything. And maybe I will. I haven't made up my mind. It, it actually fits better now that I've cleaned it up. It didn't look like it fit at all a moment ago. And this is the first time I've tried it since I cleaned this all up. It still doesn't fit end to end. It's a little weird. And somebody shaped it kind of strange. They beveled off the ends, which really typically they don't do that. 
typically they fit in there nice and square and everything fits up. So I think I'm just going to make a whole new block out of some ebony. This is a fairly important piece because, you know, it's taken the whole uh, stress here of the uh, strings and everything, wrapping them down to the uh, tail pin. So it is a fairly important piece. I think I'll just make a new one and make it fit in here just real airtight instead of, you know, being loosey-goosey like it would be if I used the original. Just thought I'd show you that I made the tail block here for the uh, tail piece to ride over the top of that. And I made it out of ebony, just a piece of scrap uh, ebony that was off of a fingerboard. And the piece fits in there pretty snug. I generally even like them a little bit tighter than that. It doesn't have any play, but it's not quite as tight fitting as I was expecting. But anyway, it's fine. It's uh, contoured appropriately. You want to have just a little bit of height so that the tailpiece doesn't ride on this, but not too much height. And I think I'm in that ballpark there. This one was the one that was on there, and it was just not made very well. It, doesn't, it didn't fit very well at all. So now it does fit, and I think it looks better. So we're going to glue that in place. In this case, I think I'll just use the superfatic glue. It's hard to clamp this, and the superfatic glue tacks up pretty fast, pretty quickly. I can get some clamps on this to hold it temporarily, I believe. It's the next day, my friends. I have touched up some of the finish and things off camera just to make it look a little nicer. I haven't oiled it yet with linseed oil, but I am going to do that, wipe it down really good. I'll do that off camera too, and I think that'll make it look much better. Uh, at the moment, I'm gonna work on putting on these tuning keys. I do not like these mechanical keys at all on a violin or a fiddle. The customer's note indicates that he really likes these, and you know, so I'm not gonna try to talk him out of it. That's what it had on it before. The holes are there, but they are wallowed out. Now, I find it a little bit funny that uh, the kind of screws that were used to put this on were machine screws. You know, they're not wood screws. These are the kind of screws that would typically screw into a nut or something like that, or a threaded hole. But with the wood like that, that's not the way to put these on. So, I found some more regular tiny wood screws, but these holes are too large and they're kind of wallowed out anyway, which you would expect from those other screws. So I'm going to fill them with toothpicks first, then remount this with proper wood screws. Like I said, it's not my favorite way to set it up, but that's, you know, just following the customer's wishes there. And everybody knows that the customer is right. My friends, I want to talk to you about setting this violin up a little bit. The uh, bridge that uh, is in the case is going to be too low because I do have this up at a good angle, 7 eighths of an inch, so that'll give you a lot of down pressure here. So I'm going to make a new bridge for it. I'm going to have to make a new nut for it. And right now, you can see that I've already got that piece in place, but I've got to fit the end pin. The end pin that came with it sort of works. For my taste, it's too loose of a fit, and it's very short. It's a very short end pin. So to me, I would prefer the longer end pin, even if it goes all the way through the hole. And the reason is, you know, because it's going to be torqued like this. And that way, you know, it, there's not much chance that it's going to work its way out. The last time I fitted one of these up, I showed a very uh, long process of where I shave this pin down and how I shave it down. And many comments came in and said, I'm doing it all wrong, that I should be using a reamer, ream this hole out, and then just stick the pin in there. Yeah, you can do that. But guess what that does? That makes that hole bigger each time, and every time you make in the hole bigger. So what my method is, is just to reach in here, uh, clean the hole up, but don't really try to ream it. I just want to try to get, you know, any roughness in the hole out of there and just smooth the hole. That's all I try to do. I don't try to make it any bigger. 
So, and I also try to uh, adjust, uh, you know, like if it's not running straight, like sometimes they can really be off at an angle. I mean, they really can be out or up. And this one's kind of up a little bit. So I right, might ream the bottom of the hole a little bit more than the top. But anyway, I try not to make much of a change in the size of the hole. And then I put the pin in and sh shape the pin to fit the hole. And that way you get an incredibly tight fit, number one. And number two, you're not enlarging the hole. So that's why I do what I do. And yes, it takes longer. Yes, it's a lot of work. It's not easy, you know, but in my opinion, it's the better approach overall. You know, you can disagree. So off camera, I scraped it a little bit already. Once you scrape it, uh, you put it in and you twist it like this. And then where it is rubbing becomes a little bit shiny and you can also see it marked around the edges. You know, since I've got carpet down here, I put it on something hard like this. And then I just go around it very carefully and scrape it and try to scrape all that mark off of there. And if there's a high side on the peg, it'll show up more and you just scrape more on that side. Most of the marks on this were down toward the end. So the end is large, it looks like. By doing it this way, you will eventually make this peg pretty much exactly the same shape as the hole or as close to it as you can get. It's getting very close now. We're only about an eighth inch away. Sometimes it only takes two or three times to do this. Other times it's quite arduous. And honestly, this one's not showing up all that great in terms of where it's rubbing. Most of the time they show up better than this one's showing up. It could be just because it's rubbing pretty equally all the way around. Now this time I'm scraping toward the button and the reason is because I want to get right up to the button so that the angle, you know, it will allow me to push the, all the way in to the button. This actually takes off more than you might think. It does a pretty good job. It's even a little closer this time. Probably could knock it in there if I wanted to and it would never come out. I don't like to knock them in until I get them really close. This one may be close enough. It's, it's pretty close. In fact, I can't pull it out now. That can be a real prop. Yeah, I can't get it out. That sometimes happens. Hopefully I can use the plastic lip pliers and pull it out, hopefully. There it is. Trying to see if I see any place it's rubbing. And honestly, this one's one of the hardest ones I've done that you can't you can barely see any marks on this at all. I think one more time around it and we'll call it good. Yeah, that's going to be close enough this time. So this time I'm going to just tap it in. I just take a little rubber mallet like this and just give it a good little tap. And that drives it in solid and I'm telling you for sure, you would have a lot of trouble pulling that out. I am positive I could just grab the fiddle and just turn it upside down and shake it and it would not come out. So, it's in there. That's the way I like them to fit. You know, when you get them in there, if they just go in nice and easy and you can pull them right back out, you're going to create problems on your fiddle eventually. If you get them in there like this, this will keep everything solid in the back end. Admittedly, this one is a little bit tougher to set up because of this misshapen top. Like I said, this top is really deformed in a lot of ways, but again, I still think it's the right decision to use this top since it was the grandfather's fiddle. 
But I, I have cut these feet a little bit uneven because of that to try to make it set a little more straight. And it does set up there, as you can see. I can turn it loose and it stays there. So it's not terrible. Now what I'm doing is I'm going to put this on here. This is how I kind of mark a line. I, if you see, if I'm rotating it on the treble side here. And that kind of gives you a long arc. And then on the base side, I do a shorter arc. That gives you an approximate shape that most violinists like to use. And I, you know, stay proud of that a little bit. You know, the, the fact that the pencil lead is in the center of the uh, pencil puts it up a little higher anyway. So, you know, you should be good, especially if you stay just proud of that line. You can see that I got a little close to the line right here at the high point, but mostly I left the line. Now the problem with that is that that makes the bridge really thick because we've shortened the bridge down some. So now you want to thin the bridge out quite a bit. You have to be careful when you're thinning this bridge out because, you know, the decoration here, not that it would really make a whole lot of difference on the sound, but that little piece there can break off very easily. So when you cut that piece, you want to cut into it, not across it that way. If you go across, it will break it off. So you got to be careful on certain aspects of it. Same way with these other little decoration places here. You got to be careful how you cut them. With those, you do have to cut them this way because that's the way they're shaped. But anyway, as long as you're careful, you can cut it with your finger plane. And your finger plane is, is by far, and at least in my opinion, the fastest way to go. You can do it with a chisel too. And some folks do that. But I am much better with my finger planes than I am even with the chisel. And if your finger planes are really sharp, it makes very quick work of it. And for me, the thing I like about them is I can control the flatness with the finger plane really well. I turn it up and look at it every so often to make sure that the edge is staying, you know, uniformly thick all the way across. And wherever it's not, then I go to work in that area. It's getting much lighter, much thinner. You can see I've taken quite a bit of wood off just for a little, you know, quite a bit of wood really for just a little bridge like this. Having them light and airy, you know, is great up to a point. If you get them too thin, then of course your strings will bend your bridge and that's not good. But you do want to try to get it to that cutting edge, if you will, as thin as possible and still as strong as, as it needs to be. And you cut it all off of the one side, you leave the label side alone. That's really looking very good. It's pretty darn thin. I think I'm just about done. That's really suitable just the way it is. It's pretty flat and pretty smooth, but it doesn't hurt to just flatten it out a little bit with the sandpaper. And again, the purists probably wouldn't do this, but it just makes it look a little bit better, even though it's pretty darn flat. So now it's just perfectly flat. I use this tool inside here and put it where it should go, and then you can pull it up and down and lock it into place to measure the length of the sound post. And I've just checked, and the sound post that's in there, or the one that came with it, is really exactly the right length according to this. So I think we can reuse the original sound post, or at least I believe we can. I typically don't put the sound post in until I get a little bit of string tension on it. So we'll do that first. We'll go ahead and get the strings on here lightly and then we'll put the sound post in place. This is the tailpiece that was on the fiddle or at least that came with the fiddle. I don't know that this was on it. This is actually off of a smaller violin. This is probably off of a, a child size violin or a three quarter violin. 
if it was used on this, it was just improper. It shouldn't have been on there. Here's the full size tailpiece. As you can see, a significant difference in size. And some of you may say, oh, you've got a, a viola tailpiece. No, this is a 4-4 tailpiece. I guarantee you I've compared it to all my other 4-4 tailpieces. It's exactly the same size. So I know this is way small. We're going to go with this. We don't need the fine tuners since he has the mechanical tuning keys up there. So that's the way we're going to set it up. One more thing, you can see that this was tied on with many loops of monofilament fishing line. <laughs> and we are basically doing the same thing, except it's just one large piece of monofilament fishing line. This is actually, uh, you know, specifically designed for violins. It's a nylon loop, tailpiece loop. It does have these threaded ferrules on here, and we're just tightening that down to get it approximately uh, where it should be. And the way you kind of test this is you put it over your tail pin, you pull this up, and there should just be a little clearance here of your tail piece. You don't want it your tail piece touching this piece. You don't want it way up that way. You know, maybe an eighth inch that way would be fine. As long as it's got some clearance here, you're in pretty good shape. I could maybe take a little less clearance there, just a little less. So I'll, I'll tighten it up just a tiny bit. And then all of this excess here you can cut off because it's just decoration and it's just going to be something that could potentially scratch something or vibrate or whatever. So if it's outside of the nut, it is serving no purpose at all. So just to be safe though, I'll leave about, oh, maybe an eighth inch sticking outside the nut for adjustment purposes. So you can see there how I cut it off, I think. But that's not enough to vibrate. And now we've got it up in pretty good shape there. Now we just have the strings to put on here and the uh, sound post. And well, I'm getting a little ahead of myself. I still haven't made the nut yet, so I do have to make a nut yet. I've got the nut made and there's just a lot of little touch up that needs to be done on this. I noticed that the fingerboard was pretty scratched up so I decided to sand it down and uh, we'll sand it down and then we will uh, dye it black. This will just get rid of any real roughness or big grooves that are in there. Got brand new plush carpet on my uh, desk here or on my workbench and it's already getting stained. Mostly the staining is from the actual sanding dust, believe it or not. You can vacuum it up and it just doesn't come out like this is just from some ebony. This was from some other yellow wood, I guess. I'm not sure, but anyway, it definitely stains the carpet just from the sanding. That's pretty smooth. You can still see it, but I don't think you'll be able to see it once I dye it black. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it just because it will just run up his bill. As long as it's smooth enough to play, that's all that really matters. And I'll show you what it looks like after I get her all cleaned up and dyed up and uh, oiled down, and then we'll put the strings on it. Even though I've done this dozens of times in videos, I feel like I have to explain it's boiled linseed oil because I get the question every time. Raw linseed oil, I don't think it really ever dries. This stuff here takes a long time to dry, but I don't leave it on there. I wipe it right back off. So I kind of use it almost like a cleaner and a conditioner. It just makes everything look better. It's good for the wood. Wherever you have bare wood, it's good for that. My friends, I've got the linseed oil all over the violin. I wiped it on and then I wiped it back off with a dry cloth. I was talking to Jamie Colpitts up there in uh, Moncton, New Brunswick, Canada, uh, while I was doing this. And I actually put the oil on the fingerboard 
before I was ready while I was talking to Jamie. But I don't think that's going to stop this dye. This stuff goes through just about anything. So I'm putting the dye on there now. Jamie was telling me about a guitar, a DM Series Martin, that they needed to do a neck reset on. So him and his friend were taking it apart and they found that it had one bolt in the bottom, which we knew that, but he said that the dovetail joint went horizontally through the top of the neck area. He said there was no way to get it apart. And he said they pretty much destroyed it getting it apart. He said now they have to rebuild it all. He's gonna send me pictures and if I get pictures that are suitable that I can show on my uh, shop talk, I'll put it in my next shop talk coming down the road. So more than likely that will have already occurred by the time you see this video. So if you're interested in that, look up my shop talk dated sometime after Halloween. That's looking nice. That looks so much better now. It looks like a well cared for old fiddle now uh, instead of a box of parts. I didn't mention it before but this tailpiece also in addition to the fact that it's a much nicer tailpiece I'm giving this to the customer free even though it's virtually brand new. It was in my spare parts bin it could be one that I purchased years ago, but then again, it may be one that someone sent me recently in all those parts, because I did get a lot of parts. But uh, either way, it's in the spare parts bin, and we will just give it away. I do have the nut made as well as you can see. I don't have any grooves in it yet for the strings. And one more thing I'd like to do back here is I'm putting a little tension on this, pulling on this, and I typically mark the two little nylon ropes that are coming across this tail block. I mark it on both sides like that. And maybe you can see those pencil marks now, hopefully. I think you can. And then I just take a little tiny round file and run it up through there just a little bit, just to get a little bit of a indention in that so that the uh, tailpiece doesn't slip around and kind of finds its little resting place there, little, its little home. Doesn't take a lot, but uh, it's kind of awkward the way I'm holding it here, so I'm gonna pull it down here where I can get to it a little bit better. That ought to be sufficient. Let's get the strings and get started. My friends, we're gonna string this violin up with these strings here. Now, these are strings that I know nothing about, to be perfectly honest. I put them on one other violin, and that violin was uh, a wall hanger, to say the least. These were sent to me as samples to test them out and see what I thought about them. Um, I originally thought we'd be able to play that wall hanger, and it really wasn't a very playable instrument. This one is going to be playable. I'm not sure just how what kind of quality we're dealing with here on this violin. It's a lesser expensive violin, but on the other hand, it may have a decent sound. You know, I, I'm hoping I can uh, give them a fair test on this violin. What I do like about these strings is that even the E string is wound. It's not just a plain string. And that right there is worth its weight in gold often in terms of the way uh, strings sound on violins. So these are uh, you know, medium silver and aluminum wound is what it says. So here we go. We'll see how it works out. I'm gonna do most of this setup off camera. If I get to a point where I think you need to see something, I'll show you show you something that I'm doing here for these uh, strings winding them up. Now keep in mind, you know, I don't recommend these kinds of tuning keys on a violin, but since I don't want to cut the strings off, because that's not normally done on a violin, you normally leave them full length. Just found this little tool here and put it in the drill and then this can spin them up. Since, I'm, since I've got a long ways to wind, it's just easier to do it this way. And then I can hold it here with my finger, hold the tension. Yeah. 
there you go see it just saves a lot of twisting of your wrist there and right now with my arthritis twisting my thumbs is not my favorite thing to do so got two strings on there part of the way I'll show you what it looks like here in a minute in case you're wondering it's just a very simple little tool there that I was using to twist that with just you can make one on a drill press in a few minutes or you know with a saw you know very easy to make just so that uh, really did save me a lot of twisting with my hands so it worked just fine and with one of these variable speed uh, battery operated drills you know you can turn it really really slow and steady so you don't have to worry about twisting something and breaking it or anything while I've got just a little bit of tension on the bridge and it's very minimal I mean like these strings barely have any tension at all while I have that minimal tension on there I'm going to set the sound post now that is providing I can find it again because sometimes if you can't find them you can't set them but we'll find it here in a moment and we'll be back shortly for you it'll just be a second success I found it and I stabbed it because I was mad at it my little tool here is just a coat hanger wire and it's sharpened to a point and then the very 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 tip and I mean I can't emphasize how tiny is bent over as a fish hook so as small as you can make that I'm talking just the very tip end like the end of a pin and then you screw that into your wood and that helps hold it with that little hook and then try to get it through this hole and set it in place and the proper place is negotiable depending on who you're talking to but for me it's about an eighth inch behind the bridge behind the treble foot of the bridge at least that's what I try to do now I'm gonna get the light down here where I can hopefully see what I'm doing and I I'm still having trouble seeing what I'm doing let me try it over here yeah that's better and at the moment I gotta tell you this sound post seems really tall and I don't know exactly why but it really does seem really tall so I'm just gonna take it out of there and work on taking it out and it basically you have to unscrew it out of there and light is terrible here right at the moment but maybe you can see that little tiny hook on the end of there very tiny but that's how I do it so I'm gonna go and knock off just a little bit of the ends of this on my sander and when you knock these off you want to try to knock them off at a slight angle so that it will match the inside of the top and the inside of the back so both of these are at a very slight angle the top angled this way the bottom angled this way and, uh, and you're pulling it toward yourself so you're pulling it tighter but just a little bit of an adjustment on this can make a huge difference so that's what I'm gonna go do I have them beveled and I, in addition I also just barely bevel off the round the outer edge of the, both ends and that way it slides better inside instead of having it a square end on there and I think I've got it this time it looks like it's gonna go right where I want it based on what I can tell right now and then of course it just moved big time on me and that's only because we're on camera ah and it fell loose there's another little fancy tool I have well after another exhaustive search I found my retrieval tool this is a sound post retrieval tool and it works really good you can get it out by just turning it upside down and shaking it and all that kind of thing but if you can get this over the post and push down it just grabs it and takes it right out of there and it's very easy works better if you grab it a little further toward the middle but there we go so I can just grab it and jerk it right out of there maybe it was Chuck or someone else sent me this tool for setting sound posts I have never used this I know that a lot of people use this I'm gonna try this and see if it will work for me haven't tried it before so let's just 
try it. Yeah, might be, might be good. Oh, knocked it over. Did it again. Well, this can be a very frustrating process, as you can tell. Lots of folks tell me that setting the sound post is the hardest thing they do. I honestly don't think it's all that terribly hard most of the time. It's only really hard for me whenever I'm doing it on camera. <laughs> and that's pretty much the truth. I don't know. I just... I thought I'd try that through that big hole, but that didn't work at all. I have to have to do it through here. F hole is very tiny and it will just barely let me get this thing through there. There it is. Once you get it, it's pretty easy. I'll try it again. I'll try it again with this uh, tool and see how that works. Huh. That tool pulls out really easy. That's the problem with that tool. Yeah. Well, I'm not that good with that tool yet, so I think I'll go back to my coat hanger. You know, sometimes gravity doesn't work inside these. You can tilt it one way and it'll go the other way. It's amazing. And then finally, it decides to cooperate. So I'm going to go back to my coat hanger trick and see if it works better. I don't know that it will, but I'll give it a shot. Now you notice the coat hanger, it has a hook on the back end too for pulling the post and adjusting it. But we'll see. The other tool seems really good. I think maybe my problem is that this post still just isn't optimal length yet. That could be the problem. Ah, it doesn't want to cooperate. Well, you can see my process. I'll get it set and then I'll turn the camera back on here in just a moment. I do have the sound post in there now. I doubt you'll be able to see it. I'll twist it around a little bit there in the light. Maybe you can see through the hole and see it. It's right behind here. It should be right about under here somewhere. I don't know if you'll see that or not in there. Probably not because it's difficult to get the light down in there where you, the camera could see it. But anyway, it's in there. And by the way, I got it on the first try after I turned the camera off. It's probably just nerves, you know, I'm not used to being in front of the camera. If you believe that, I've got some uh, ground down in Florida, right there in the middle of the Okeechobee, I want to sell you. Trying to just spread these out. I like them spread out on the nut, you know, so that you have plenty of room to play and finger it, you know, and yet still, you know, enough room on your fingerboard as well. So I've got them separated there pretty well. I think I'm going to go ahead and uh, mark them where I have them. In this case, I think I'll just use my little nut file and deepen it. It'll just do a good job. I like to get them where they're almost touching the fingerboard. Makes them so much easier to note. Might have to come back and deepen these a little bit more yet. Now we'll turn our attention to the setup on this end. And once again, I like to spread it out a little more than what some folks do. I think it's easier to play and I think it's, you know, spreads the sound out across the violin a little bit better too. And now we're going to check the length. So I like to set this at 325 millimeters. And that's measured down your E string. That's not going to work on this one. I mean, it really does depend on the instrument. This one here is going to be 330, it looks like. And there's not going to be much choice on that. So it's back a half a centimeter five millimeters further than 
I mean, you could move it forward, but it's it just wouldn't look right on this particular violin. So we're going to leave it right there. So yes, the fret scale can be different from one violin to another, and that happens quite frequently, actually. I'm going to go ahead and mark the two outside strings. I don't do much of a groove there, just a tiny little groove. That just locks them in where they can't really move. And then these other two strings, I'm going to split the difference. And with that, that pretty much completes the setup. Now we just need to tune this baby up and see what she sounds like. I had it all stringed up and I had it tuned up, but there was a high spot right here on the fingerboard. The D string was buzzing off of that high spot. So we're gonna have to do a little bit of leveling. Having a good scraper that really peels the stuff off is a big plus. That really just took a few seconds. I'm pretty sure that's gonna do it. Now I'll take this little sanding block and uh, just kind of level it out a little bit, smooth it off a little bit. I imagine that will be fine. I'll just take a straight edge, lay it on here and see if I see any problem. Get the old close-up glasses going. That's pretty darn flat now. Actually, there's still a little rocking hump in one spot there. There's a spot right in here where it's a little bit high. That's looking pretty good now. I'll clean that up and dye it back and I think we'll be ready to play it. Well, I've got the strings loose on it. I'm gonna go ahead and put a little bit of this new oil on here. This is this beeswax based oil. It's a food grade oil. I think it'll make a good protectorant for this wood. And it goes on very thin. I think it will also help the uh, dye from coming off. It actually did remove a little bit of dye, but I think it's fine. Kind of looks like it's been played. Well, we'll tune it up and see how it plays now. Well, my friends, I got her all fixed up. Turned out pretty darn nice. Got a pretty decent sound. Not a bad sound at all. On the mellow side. Now I have two choices. I can just let you hear it like that and call it good, or I can try to play it, which I'm not a fiddle player. So, you know, you just have to suffer through what I can do. So if you don't want to hear this, turn it off now. <laughs> but at least you can kind of tell it's got some volume and everything. here too. I'm too close to the table. I should have backed up. Bow hitting down here on the table and everything else. And I got other excuses if you want to hear them. Bottom line is I don't know how to play a fiddle. So, but I can tell that it's got a pretty decent sound. I think if it's played in and I was, you know, also curious about these uh, strings from Korea, if they're any good. And I don't think they're bad. I mean, I don't think they're the best strings I've ever heard, but on the other hand, considering how much cheaper they are, they're really not too bad. I don't think you could go wrong getting those strings, so uh, we'll put a link in the description. I'm sure Melissa can do that. Put a link on the screen or perhaps in the description as well of where you can get these strings. I really don't think they're too bad as strings. I think you'll have to make up your own mind as a fiddle player whether you think so or not. 
but uh, I've definitely heard a lot worse strings than these. Uh, some of those uh, real cheapo strings that you get, um, man, they just don't sound good at all. But, but these are, like I said, aluminum wound, and I think they have a nylon core too, if I'm not mistaken. So they're not too bad. And the old fiddle is back alive and well, and should last at least another 50 years. So I hope you enjoyed this. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you.